today on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation about econophysics, uh, generating genuine randomness, and the rise of web journalism with Brian Hayes, mathematical journalist and author of Group Theory in the Bedroom. Brian Hayes writes the Computing Science column in American Scientist magazine, where he's a senior writer and a former editor. His new book, called Group Theory in the Bedroom, collects and updates 12 of his essays on matters mathematical and computational. Brian, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I guess the first thing we should do is to clear up what's going on in the title essay, Group Theory in the Bedroom. What What's the problem you're trying to solve with mathematics there? The book actually got noticed by someone who does uh, does reviews of erotica, <laughs> and I'm afraid they were terribly disappointed. Um, I am, of course, being slightly mischievous with the title, but it has nothing to do with anything in the bedroom other than furniture rearranging. It's, it's about the problem of flipping your mattress. Um, I was lying in bed awake one night having flipped my own mattress earlier in the day and bothered by the thought that this is a a chore you do infrequently enough that by the time you do it you've forgotten how you did it last time and it struck me that turning it from side to side and turning it from end to end or spinning it around um, all have different effects and that if I wasn't um, thoughtful, I might wind up doing the same thing over and over again. So I was trying to imagine some kind of, of trick or procedure or, or other way of not having to worry about this, that if I could always do it the same way every time, I would cycle through all the possible configurations of the mattress. So the essay is uh, what followed from that late night insomniac uh daydream night dream i guess i sort of hate to to give a spoiler at this point but i guess the world is not uh desperate to to know the answer to this problem um beyond the fact that i don't have an answer and in fact there isn't an answer there's there's not a, a perfect way to uh solve this problem and where does group theory come in? Where does that branch of mathematics enter the equation, so to speak, when you're dealing with the matrices? Oh, group, group theory is, is one of those things that has a terrible name. Um, it, the name hardly describes what it's all about, and, and it would be well to forget it. It's, it's about the, the notion of symmetry, meaning not just mirror images and things like that, but all of the ways that you can change something that doesn't that don't change it for example with with a mattress uh when you flip it over from end to end or from side to side it comes to rest in a position where you might as well have left it left it where it was in the first place so there's a there's a symmetry there um, and group theory is just the the way of of analyzing what kinds of symmetries objects have. And toward the end of that chapter, there are a couple proposed solutions, none of them hugely elegant as the one you were trying to look for, but what are some of the ways that you can deal with this mattress problem? You can cheat, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, I, I really I don't write a hints from Heloise column, uh, and I'm probably not the best person to turn to for household advice, but... Many people pointed out to me, and and I was able to to sort of work this out on my own as well. That if you if you really care about this um, more than I do, perhaps um, if you simply mark the mattress in certain ways, um, you could put a dot in one corner or put an arrow somewhere on it. Um, you can then, if you remember what it means, you can be sure of of not simply repeating yourself, but but going through all the, the states of the mattress. Having established that you don't write a hints from Heloise's column, 
Maybe you should describe a little bit about what you do write in your column just be, for people who haven't read American Scientist before. I'm, let's see, how to put it. I, I write essays, um, and they, in many cases, are somewhat personal essays, but they have a, a mathematical approach to the world or uh, a computational way of looking at things. I'm, I'm a person like you know anyone else. I'm trying to make sense of the world that I live in, um, and it so happens that that I find the tools and toys of mathematics are helpful to me in that, in, uh, in the same way that you know, other people might rely on, on other realms of knowledge. The essays that I collected in this volume, the one on mattress flipping is, is not exactly a, a problem that's uh, of earth-shaking importance. Some of the others I think take on topics that uh, that aren't quite as uh, playful, um, but might be might be more important. Um, there's there's one on war and peace, for example, which seems to be the the never ending struggle. And uh, in that, I uh, revisit the work of a uh, mid 20th century mathematician named Louis Fry Richardson, who spent a lot of a lot of thought and did a lot of work on uh, asking what what statistical and mathematical methods can tell us about uh, outbreaks of war and outbreaks of peace i've also uh, i've written a, a piece on the on the question of the distribution of wealth and uh, what we can learn about that by using very simple computer models so it's it's a a varied diet, I would say. Uh, some are very uh, much tied to to my own events in my own life, and and some take a broader view. When someone thinks of a column, I think if they haven't seen your column, they'll imagine you know seven hundred words and on the back page of a magazine. But yours is is more than a column, as you said. It's it's complete essays. They you get some space there. And what is it about American Scientist magazine that affords you that amount of of space to work, about that amount of uh, intellectual freedom, I guess, I should say. Well, I'm very lucky, is one answer to that. Uh, American Scientist is, is a terribly underappreciated magazine at this point in the, in the history of the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's carrying on a tradition that goes back decades of trying to present serious science, not to say solemn science, but but science with with meat on its bones to uh, a very broad public, uh, including people within the sciences, but also anybody who has a, an enthusiastic interest. As I say, I'm I'm a lucky guy in that uh, I do get four or five, or sometimes even more pages of the magazine six times a year, and it's a wonderful pulpit to have. I think perhaps one ought to ask why aren't such things appearing elsewhere rather than why do they appear in, in American Scientist. Um, there are some other science magazines, and I would be uh, more than delighted to have not so much competition as, as a society of others who are, who are writing the same kinds of essays. Um, there, there are not enough places in the world for them, and there are lots of other people with interesting things to say uh, that deserve broader exposure. So what is it in perhaps the the culture of American scientists that separates it from the other science magazines people might be reading today, such as a Scientific American, which you edited? Um, many years ago I did, uh, and it was a somewhat different publication in those days. I guess the, to talk about publishing in general uh, it's a it's a difficult moment I think in in the history of of ink on paper uh, I'm not not wanting to to start analyzing um, why it's happening but uh, the economic situation of uh, of a great many publications is not particularly bright or encouraging right now if you look deeper than that uh, the situation of the world is one where 
we have unprecedented and, and absolutely fabulous access to information of all kinds. What you can learn today in 10 minutes with Google or Wikipedia or something like that is just phenomenal. And I'm absolutely all for it. I, I think, you know, it's, I, I'm all for it not just for other people, but for me too. I rely on, on such resources myself. Um, so we have, we have this wonderful world where we can, where we can get at things. Um, it's much harder now to evaluate them, to learn which ones we most ought to pay attention to. Um, those are the kinds of questions that publications like American Scientist and Scientific American have traditionally helped people to cope with. Uh, you have an editor there who's deciding one thing is, is worth five pages or eight pages or ten pages in a, in a major national magazine. Um, that role is um, not being performed as effectively today as it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, something's eventually, I expect, going, going to step into that void and provide some, some means of, of sorting through uh, these wonderful resources that we have, it's not entirely clear to me what that's going to be or how it's going to work. Um, there are lots of thoughtful people who are, who are working on this, but I, I don't know how it comes out yet. Here's what I always hope, and you can tell me what you think of it from your position on the inside. I see the pressure and I hear about the pressure put on traditional print magazines and newspapers, etc., by the blogosphere, as they call it, and everything else available online, as you mentioned. Now, I always imagine that that kind of pressure might lead to some kind of shakeout where magazines and such are winnowed down to only some of the better ones. Those would be the surviving ones. It would, in other words, improve the overall quality of the magazine, of the print journalism landscape. Is there a chance of that, or am I just dreaming? I think, I think one ought to, to not put it in terms of, of print opposing online publications. Those two things, in the long run, I, I strongly suspect that that online publications win and and print becomes something more of a niche product but it really doesn't matter one way or the other the the issue here is not whether something is published online or published on paper it's whether it's a coherent edited presented uh, uh volume of work that has has been selected and, and thoughtfully brought before the reader, or whether it is, in fact, what you find in the search results from Google, um, which is uh, going to always be more voluminous and probably richer in many senses, but lacks uh, a certain coherence, I think. Uh, there's, there's got to be room for both. I would like to, to share your optimistic view that that we're going to see some kind of selective process where where the best win out, whether on paper or online. I'm a believer in natural selection, so I I'm sure that in fact uh, is is a process that's going on now. But it's a it's a long ways from here to there. Uh, I'm uh, there are questions of how how this new world is organized. Uh, we see the economic issues arising in publishing, in the music industry, uh, where we're suddenly liberated on, on many fronts. Um, it's much easier for lots of people to produce creative content uh, in lots of media. Um, I mean, it was much harder to, to create a publication, to... Uh, produce a, a music recording, to produce a, a film or video in the days before computers and the Internet. And yet, on the other hand, it's becoming harder to do these things uh, as a way of making a living. Uh, and I'm not, in the long run, I'm not worried. I know that a solution to this is going to be found. It's just not altogether clear to me what it is yet. How much would you agree that 
the challenge of the information consumer right now in this moment in 2008 is to strike a balance between getting that sheer raw quantities of information that they would get from, say, a Google and balancing that with getting information from not necessarily a gatekeeper but a selector like a good, competent editor, like you said. Is that is that what a consumer of information has to do to, to balance those out for themselves? Well, if the gatekeeper exists, then the consumer gatekeeper, editor, selector, whatever, gatekeeper is probably a, not the ideal uh, metaphor since you don't really want to keep people out or keep people away, but um, you want to offer guidance. Um, and And it's more than... Let me see. It's it's more than just selecting from what's out there. Um, a magazine like American Scientist or Scientific American, or you know, in other realms in 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 the literary area, uh, they do more than just um, filter out bad stuff and thereby give prominence to good stuff. Uh, in in many ways, there are creative acts going on in the process of that publishing process, um, so that things that, that didn't exist at all come into being as a result of, of the activities of, of editors and producers and, and all of those who, who are involved, not so much in the direct creation of, of the written word or the, the film, um, but, but who are nonetheless essential to having it happen, those people still exist uh, and still do wonderful work. I don't think we have to choose between the free-for-all of anybody can have a blog and the more restrictive model of only those who own a printing press uh, have the freedom to publish. There's plenty of room for for uh, coexistence, I think. Um, you know, we're in we're in the middle of some kind of transition, and uh, probably ought to enjoy the uncertainty because it makes life more interesting. Now, you're unusually well placed to talk about this sort of thing because not only are you, as we said, you're well placed in traditional journalism, but you're also a blogger. You have a blog and a very fascinating one, I might add, called BitPlayer. It's at bit hyphen player dot org for those playing the home game and what are the advantages you find in in one versus the other since you work in both worlds i've been in in more traditional publishing for a long career uh thirty some years and i've been blogging for maybe two or three years now they're very different experiences uh i wouldn't want to give up either one uh, i'm I'm just delighted with the facility of of blogging where even even in my blog I tend to to be kind of more uh considered and careful and and constrained than lots of people who who let it all hang out um I I write pieces that tend to take a day or two to to polish and I'm not inclined to Twitter. It's it's still even for someone like me, uh, it's just magic to be able to sit down at a keyboard wherever and type things out and and then press a button and all of a sudden there it is uh, up there on the screen and everybody can see it. I think this is just fabulous, and the fact that there are thousands or millions or or however many of us there are doing it um, i I just think this is absolutely great. The promise of of the internet when it first became popular in the in the early nineties to me it, it was this whole notion of two way communication that that all of the mass media of the past had been uh, somebody talking and everybody else listening. Radio and television were very much in that mode. Publishing on paper had been hardly better than than those two. It was generally those who were able to make a big investment who could set up a way to, to reach the masses. For a long time, that promise of the internet seemed to be slipping away. That that 
uh, it was going to become another medium where you could, you know, you could go to CNN online instead of going to CNN on the television, but it was the same CNN and the same rather, uh, it's the same privileged few who got to talk and everybody else got to listen. Uh, blogging has actually offered, you know, now, uh, just about anybody with close to zero investment can actually speak. And so we're in this interesting situation where, where the question is, um, not how do you get access to the medium, but how do you, how do you attract readers? How, how does anybody know you're there? I think that's an interesting problem and not necessarily an easy one to solve, but I think it's, it's just fabulous that this uh, technical barrier has been lowered to the point where, where just about all of us can take part. I found it fascinating thinking about the Internet and thinking, oh, back in, say, 1993 when adoption started getting very widespread, and you think forward to the time when blogs got big about, I don't know, 2002, it seems to me that that, it seems like more of a delay than there should have been there, but you've had your eye on the world of computing very closely. And is, is that about how long that sort of thing might take, in your opinion, or were blogs, did blogs take a while, like, I, like it seems to me they did? In retrospect, we can say, what were we waiting for? Why didn't, why didn't this happen sooner? I guess the, the reason I would be cautious to... Uh, cautious about complaining there is I didn't think of it either. The technical means that we use now probably did require uh, some evolution, some experimentation. Um, nobody in 1993 could have just come along and created WordPress or, or TypePad or something like that. And yet, um, it could have happened sooner if if anyone had realized that this was something that might work. The history of the technical side of this, I think, is probably going to be very interesting. I don't know enough about who did what and when. I'd like to read about it at some point, and I'm, I'm sure that, that somebody's going to do a great book on, on how we all became bloggers. Getting back to your book, Group Theory in the Bedroom, you mentioned a chapter where there's an economic simulation run of a, of a closed economy, and with random trades as far as I understand it, wealth does end up getting concentrated in the hands of one player. Now, what's, what are the workings behind that? What's the gears turning there? It's a cool idea that came... I, I didn't invent this by any means. Um, there were a number of, of mostly physicists, as it turns out. They now call themselves econophysicists, who began looking at an aspect of the economy that economists have not paid a whole lot of attention to. And, and it goes like this, that if you, uh, if you follow conventional economic principles, uh, what something is worth and what its price is are always exactly the same, because that's how you define worth, that you know, whatever a willing seller and a willing buyer uh, can agree to is what something is said to be worth. Which is, you know, in some some large scale sense, it's got to be true, uh, or s over some long period of time. Uh, if if there were a discrepancy there, it would get adjusted out of the way. But if you think about sort of more everyday, short term transactions, uh, the idea is that every time you make a purchase, or if you're selling something, that the price is always exactly right. It's kind of implausible that to say that that um, that there are never variations from from the true value of something is to say that nobody ever gets a bargain, uh, or uh, you know nobody ever pays too much for something. And common sense tells you that this just isn't true. That that all the time you you know you find. Gasoline at at five cents a gallon more on one street corner than on the other, and it's the same gasoline. So the physicists began looking at what happens to an economy if, in fact, there are these little discrepancies between what something ought to cost and what it really costs. And they set up elaborate 
simulations, elaborate in the sense of, of many thousands or millions of transactions were simulated. They're actually, what's going on is really very simple. It's just people exchanging money or goods. And the answer, you know, the kind of disturbing answer is that even if, if people are not uh, skilled bargainers or there are no differences between people, that they're all just subject to these random slight fluctuations, as the economy goes on, uh, there's this effect that whoever has more tends to get more. Uh, if you simply let that process go for a while, then eventually you find out that that everybody, that all of the all of the wealth has wound up in in the hands of one player, which is not good for anybody. I mean, it means almost all of the people have nothing. Um, even the, the supposed winner of this game, the the one who's got all the money, can't buy anything because. Nobody has anything to sell. So it's, it's just a frozen, collapsed economy. Obviously, this isn't realistic. Um, this, this total um, collapse of, the, of an economy has never been observed in quite that extreme form, and, and there must be something that stops it from going that far. However, uh, we do live in a time and place where uh, wealth is is strongly concentrated in a few hands and is probably becoming more so, uh, at least over a time scale of of decades. So the question then is 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 there some process like this, even even if it's not really a a model of of the economy we live in, is there some mechanism like that that's actually at work in in our daily transactions? I think I think it's um, important to ask this question and investigate. I, I don't have much confidence in my own ability to to answer the practical question there. Now, I wonder about this, because in the book you mentioned that, of course, the model does not account for any new wealth being created. There's a static amount of wealth, and that that's in a ways what leads to the economy in these models seizing up. What do you think the fact that the pie does grow in the world we live in means as far as applying this model to real life or looking for where this model might actually exist in real life, the fact that more wealth is made? Uh, one possible answer there is that that's what what disguises the effect or or prevents it from going all the way to completion that's a possibility but but one that uh, economists don't really view very uh, favorably there's a sense in which it's just irrelevant um, if you can you can ask about the distribution of wealth in a population or the distribution of anything else for that matter uh, in a way that that ignores the the overall quantity um, even if we all have more collectively, uh, so that the poorest among us are actually better off than they used to be, uh, if the distribution is getting more extreme, so that the, even though everybody's getting richer, the richer getting richer, richer. Uh, if that's the case, then then this is a, a an issue that that needs to be acknowledged and maybe addressed on its own. And of course, if the process of growth were to stop and the distributional mechanism continued to work, then uh, the consequences are going to be just that much more unpleasant. The model that we're talking about here is, is really a very simple, it's a toy economy. It's not in any way an attempt to represent what really happens in the real world, uh, there's no there's no attempt at realism there. So, trying to extrapolate from from what happens in this, it's essentially a computer game. Trying to extrapolate from that to, um, you know, what should the Federal Reserve Bank be doing? Uh, that's that's really a long stretch. And uh, I would say, what what the econophysicists have been doing is is asking questions that people ought to be thinking about, not 
offering recommendations for for how the world ought to be run or how stock markets ought to act or anything like that. This is mathematics or computer science or physics, maybe, um, much more than it is real economics. I wanted to make sure to also touch on my favorite essay in the book. It's called Random Resources, and it's about where we find randomness. And so many of us think, and I'm sure that I was under that impression before I started learning a little bit about computer science, that a computer can just generate a random number like, like the snap of the fingers, like there you go, a random number. But as it turns out, that's not the case. Why is randomness hard to actually get? John von Neumann once said something to the effect that if, if you speak about a computation or an algorithm uh, generating randomness, you're in a state of sin. I haven't quoted him exactly, but the state of sin part I remember. A computer is a, is a machine that's totally deterministic. Um, if you know um, where all of its parts are and in what configuration they're in, um, at any moment, you can say exactly what, what it's going to do next. Um, there's, there's no randomness about it at all. That means that, that you can create numbers or, or other kinds of information that look random and that uh, an ordinary person taking a glance at them could never tell the difference between coins flipped you know, with your finger and coins slipped by a computer. But uh, the truth is, the ones done by the computer are not random, and if you just know the, the trick behind it, the, the algorithm that's being used to generate uh, those streams of heads and tails, uh, you could predict every one um, without fail, even though it's, it seems to be a complete jumble of heads and tails. So if you want real randomness, and this is, this is in fact, I think, a fairly deep mystery. It's not something that anybody has really good answers to. But if you want real randomness, it seems we've got to go to the physical world, that there's no mathematical source of this stuff, that you actually have to flip a coin or wait for an atomic nucleus to the decay or something of that sort, we have to find our randomness in the physical universe and, and sort of mine it from there and then refine it and process it. We can't manufacture it out of nothing. And why that should be is really, you know, that's, that's a big puzzler. I think that's one of those metaphysical questions that uh, that people tend to focus on only late on Saturday night. But there are, in fact, there are uses for, for real uh, serious randomness and for large quantities of it. Um, if we had more of it, we could, we could do things like cryptography uh, much more easily. And so people have given thought to to how to solve this problem, and I was I was inspired to write that essay um, uh, after uh, reading a paper and then uh, chatting with a, a Harvard mathematician named Rabin, who had proposed uh, sending up satellites that, in the same way that that the uh, GPS satellites allow us to know exactly where we are anywhere on the surface of the planet uh, and, and therefore serve as a sort of public utility for, for geography, for, for location. Um, these satellites would serve as a public utility for randomness. That, uh, they would, would broadcast a, a voluminous stream of, of nonsense uh, that you could tune into anywhere you, you wanted and make use of that uh, for things like sending secret messages. Uh, I just found, I was charmed by the idea that, that it might be worth going to this much trouble to create more chaos and disorder in the world. It, it just seems like that's the one thing that we don't actually have to work so hard to get. But, but I'm wrong. We do have to work at it. It seems in this discussion there's two definitions of randomness going on. The first definition would be, it seems to me, simply a human 
can't predict it. Like when you pull out your TI-83 graphing calculator, tell it to give you a random integer, and you can't predict what's going to come next. I mean, maybe John von Neumann could figure it out, but it's an algorithm. And then the second definition of randomness, I guess the real randomness, what what is real randomness then, if not that algorithm generating something a human can't predict? You're putting your finger on that that metaphysical puzzle. We don't know, or I don't know, how the TI-83 is is generating that number. Who knows? Maybe there is some source of real randomness in there, um, but probably not. Uh, and if not, then you don't necessarily have to be John von Neumann. Um, you could just be very patient. If it's not really random, it's going to repeat itself at some point, which means if you just kept pressing that button long enough and kept a list of all the numbers it produced, eventually it would come back and, and do the same one again. And from that point, um, things get a little bit messy here, but bear with me. From that point, you could then predict every other number that it would produce. You, you could, you know, go on the stage and, and tell someone to generate a random number, and you'd just have to, to look it up on your list, and you would know what one's coming next. So it only seems random. There's, if, with enough effort, enough patience, uh, enough sort of mindlessness, um, you, you could outguess it. You could, you could predict it. With what you know, we're calling real randomness, whatever that means, all we're saying is that we don't know how to do that. No, no matter how hard you work, you don't, you don't have a way of predicting. Um, and the, the sort of gold standard for this is quantum randomness, where the theory of quantum mechanics says uh, there are things in the world that are truly unpredictable, um, that there is no algorithm, and for a long time, this was just a sort of assertion that it was, we, we believe this, um, we have lots of evidence for it, um, but of course, you can't prove that no one could ever understand it, that, that there isn't, you know, some secret TI-83 behind quantum mechanics, that, that if you just got deep enough, you would, you would be able to figure it out. However, in the, the late 60s, early 70s, I've forgotten the exact date, um, a physicist named John Bell uh, actually came up with a theorem that he was able to prove that said in a sort of indirect way, no, this is not just an assertion. This is a truth for all time. And uh, if, if it weren't true, that is, if if there were some TI-83 inside the atom that was, was actually generating random-looking things that weren't really random, if, that, if that's the way it worked, then certain experiments would come out one way, and otherwise they'd come out a different way. Well, they came out the different way, um, which is to say, according to Bell, and, and this is, you know, we've now had 40 years or so to, to look at this, uh, so it's it's really quite solid. There really is randomness in the world. There are things that that don't have a TI-83 inside them. And that's that's where things get really spooky, I think. Perhaps this is just something I can't quite get my mind around without practice, but how do you prove something is random? Yes, well, there's boy, another another big subject. Um how do you even define what it means to be random? In terms of a specific thing, you know, like I deal a deck of cards and, you know, I get uh, a poker hand of the, the four of spades and the jack of diamonds and so on. How do I say that that was a random deal and that, that, that it's, you know, not the result of some secret card stacking algorithm? And, of course, if I deal myself a royal flush or four aces or something, uh, someone's probably going to think that it wasn't so fair. Well, you can't in any one instance like that prove that um, a certain number is random or, or a certain hand in the, 
in a game of poker was generated from a random shuffling of the cards. Um, each of those, each possible hand in poker has exactly the same probability as any other hand, if in fact it is random. So from one hand, you can't tell a thing. When you, when you look at large numbers of supposedly random numbers, or if you look at lots and lots of poker hands, then you start applying statistics, and what you are basically saying is, um, here's the probability that this is a random process. And that probability is never going to be exactly one. You can never prove you know, even if somebody deals a million hands, you can never prove that they're dealing fairly and that the cards are coming from, from uh, coming out in random order. In this sense, we don't have proofs for specific instances of randomness. But if you ask sort of the, the higher level question of what, what does it mean for something to be random? Uh, you know, how, how do you characterize or describe a, a random bit of the universe? Well, there, there are some helpful and I would say insightful ideas floating out there. Um, the, the one that's, uh, best known and, and probably most useful was formulated independently by, by two guys, uh, a Russian Kolmogorov and a now an American Greg Chaitin. Um, this was in the late 60s and early 70s again. And, and the, the heart of this idea is really very simple. It says something is random if there's no way that you can describe it more concisely than just by listing all the things in it, um, for example, you know, uh, uh, an ordering of of the cards in a in a deck. If it goes all the twos, all the threes, all the fours, um, you can describe that pretty simply by saying, you know, they're in numerical order. Whereas if you have uh, if you shuffle that deck uh, and they are then thoroughly mixed up. There's really no shorter way to to say anything about that ordering of the cards than just to list them all. So you've got you know you've got a list of four, 52 different cards. Um, that principle and and this gets you know very refined mathematically. You can actually measure randomness according to this scheme, where you you just take the shortest possible description. Uh, and the actual length of a sequence of numbers, for example, and the ratio of those two things becomes a, a, a nice measurement of how random it is. So it's, there, there is something, does something exist if you can measure it? Um, I'm not sure, but at least it, it kind of um, augments the reality of it to say this is something that we can we can put a ruler on or, or we can weigh it. Um, so uh, it's, it's not a totally nebulous concept. There, there are ways to speak about randomness that are pretty precise. The other favorite chapter of mine in the book is called Third Base. It deals with uh, ternary counting, which is not base 10, as we all know we learn in school, and not binary, which we all know computers use. But you make a pitch for ternary counting, and why is it good? I make a pitch because it's fun. I'm not actually one of those people who who want. I mean, there there are not a lot of agitators for base three. There there are some who want us to go to base twelve because you know there are more things that can be evenly divided if we if we use base twelve or base sixty maybe as I think the Sumerians did. I, I'm not actually in a practical way suggesting that we all ought to count in base three. On the other hand, it might be good now and then to consider the alternatives that we've we've cast aside along the way. And base three is one that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. It's a kind of orphan, uh, and there are there are some fun things about it. There's there are circumstances where it's kind of the most economical base if you. If you want to count things, 
Uh, sometimes base two is the best in the sense that that it takes the least effort. But there are there are lots of circumstances where base three beats base two, and and you can if you if you consider you know how many numbers you need and how big those numbers are, and you combine those two things, it turns out that uh, that base three is is about as good as you can do. You know, the the thing that led me to write that essay um, was another one of these crazy household things. I mean, here I am as Heloise again, um, or actually as Martha Stewart, uh, I, which is the person I wound up talking about in, in the essay itself. Um, I, I keep a lot of files, and they're the old-fashioned files, you know, in, in drawers and with folders and so on. And, you know, you, you sometimes throw a file away or, or you stick a new one into the drawer. And I realized at some point that the file drawer, it's much easier to find things if, if all of the tabs on the top of the file folders are um, sort of distributed across the width. You know, they're, they're third cut file folders. So there's some on the left and some in the middle and some on the right. And if you have two that are on the left that are right behind each other, you, you have to pull on one to see what the other one, what the one behind it says. So I know this is terribly fussy. It's just like flipping your mattress. But anyway, I thought, wouldn't life be nice if, if you could always have these things neatly arrayed so that no no two adjacent folders are both lefts or both middles or both rights. And this at first seemed like in order to, to do that, it was going to be a real pain. I mean, you know, if you put one in and it happens to be the wrong kind, then all the ones behind it are going to have to be changed. And clearly that's not worth the bother. And then I realized that that's not true, that, that there's a way of doing it that is very easy and requires um, uh, only changing the immediately adjacent um, folders. And here we come back to ternary numbers. It's actually based on a property of, of counting in base 3. And so when I realized that... Um, and began looking into the mathematics of it a little and found that, that there, was, there was actually something of greater substance than this incredibly fussy filing problem, uh, I, you know, I decided I needed to write this up. And so I sort of collected everything I knew about base three and put it down in one essay. Now, American Scientist is... I would call it a, a general reader magazine. The general public reads it. What are the challenges of getting across a lot of these mathematical ideas, some of which are quite advanced, to a reader who might not necessarily be steeped in mathematics? Well, I'm not steeped in mathematics. I'm, I'm simmered in it, maybe. Um, but I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm, I'm a writer uh, from way back. I mean, I, I started out in life as a newspaper editor, if I can understand it, I ought to be able to explain it, I think, is the, the basic equation that we have to work with. Um, and I would, I would turn that around and say that if I can't explain it, I probably don't really understand it, even if I think I do. So, so writing these things is, for me, uh, first and foremost, an, an, an exercise in learning things. Um, I, I write what I have just learned, and I'm learning it in the process of writing it. And I believe that's, um, that's a useful way to pass along knowledge. Um, if you've just gone through the steps yourself of figuring out uh, what, what an economic model means and how it works, then you've got a better chance of... of you know, talking about it to the person sitting next to you at the bar. There are ideas that are hard to fathom. Uh, I have trouble with them. I struggle with them all the time. I, I'm not suggesting that everything is easy and accessible to all of us. But 
it's sure worth the effort uh, to try to understand something on your own, and once you've done that, uh, to pass it on to, to somebody else, which is a very useful way of consolidating your knowledge. Uh, a magazine like American Scientist is committed to, to the idea that at some level, people have got to be able to, to understand, to follow along with what's going on in the world. Um, the sciences, in fact, um, are perhaps better served in this respect than other areas of inquiry. When you think about um, aspects of the arts, for example, we could use a magazine like American Scientist for music and literature and, and the graphic arts, and we actually don't have it. Uh, you know, people tend to think that, gee, the science, science and math are so much harder than, than literature. Um, literature is just words. Well, it's not so. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff happening out there, or in the social sciences, for example, in the humanities. Um, there's, there's lots of stuff going on that, that a big part of the public is not following along with. And uh, that's really unfortunate because some of it's important, some of it's interesting. And so I'm, I'm a strong advocate for, for popularization of science, uh, and it's what I've been doing with my life. Uh, and it, we, need, we need more of it, and um, I'm pressing for that. And yet I would also say we need more popularization of lots of stuff. It's not just about the sciences. And I absolutely 100% agree with that. There, there should be an American scientist for any topic out there that's worth the human inquiry, but that's unfortunately hasn't quite happened yet. That's what I always say about journalism. It's the very best thing is that it doesn't, it doesn't just require that you learn it. It actively engages you and makes you learn, and it's, that's the best part of it. Now, I could go on about this topic for a long time, but we are unfortunately out of time. So the book, once again, is Group Theory in the Bedroom. Brian Hayes, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you. I've had a great time. Our music is produced by Ben Althaus. Hear more of his stuff at benalthaus.com. Find out more about the Marketplace of Ideas or visit our online show archive at colinmarshallradio.com.